Hey y'all, how you doing? I hope you're having a great day. Today I'm going to talk about vibrational spectroscopy and how to determine if a molecule is IR or Raman active. And we're going to go through an example to learn this. So, another way of stating this is just to ask if does the molecule obey the selection rules? For example, is going to be carbon monoxide, which the Lewis dot structure for carbon monoxide looks like this. It's a linear molecule, and the oxygens each have two lone pairs on them. Now, to determine if this molecule is IR or Raman active, first we have to ask. What are the vibrational modes? Well, maybe even before that, we should ask how many. So the rule to determine how many vibrational modes is 3n minus 6, or if it's linear, which we have a linear molecule here, it's 3n minus 5, where n is the number of atoms. So we have three atoms, we'll plug 3 in for n, and we get four. So we have four vibrational modes. Now what are those vibrational modes? Let's draw them out here. So one is called the symmetric stretch, which is where both oxygens, well imagine the carbon staying stationary, it's where both oxygens extend or compress by the same amount. That's called the symmetric stretch. And you can probably guess what I'm going to do next. If one is going in slightly, I'm drawing the arrow little to depict that it's barely moving. The carbon's still stationary. But if one's going out a long ways, then that's the anti-symmetric stretch. Another vibrational mode is if both oxygens bend down, essentially to make the molecule not planar anymore, or not linear anymore. It would sort of bend, so it's more shaped like a triangle, like water. This would be called uh, the in-plane bend, or just bend. And the fourth one, it's a little tricky. It's the same thing, except since we live in three dimensions, it could bend down or up, that's the same mode, or it could bend in or out of the paper. So I'll just draw that with these little arrows, and the X represents going into the paper. But I could, you could also think of it as going out of the paper. It's the same bending mode. These are two, what are called degenerate modes. They're going to have the same energy. Okay, so those are the modes. Now, we want to know if carbon dioxide is IR active. So we're asking, is CO2 IR active? Well, that's the same as saying, what are the selection rules for carbon monoxide? Well, the selection rule is, it must change its dipole to be active in that mode. So, we're asking what modes have a change in dipole? Because that's the selection rule, and I went over that a couple videos ago. Well, does one have a change in dipole? No, it does not. Because both oxygens are going to stretch by the same amount. So, no. Does 2 have a change in dipole? Yes, it does, actually. If one oxygen is going in, but one stretching out, you're going to have a, a dipole that points towards... where a lot of negative charge is going to be near the oxygen. So the dipole would point towards the oxygen. So that is yes. 3... Well, you're bending 
two negatively, well, relatively negatively charged atoms down, and the positively charged one is up. So, again, the answer is yes, and the dipole would point down in that case, in the case where I've drawn it here. Four, yes, it's the same thing as case three. So, we know that we, if we take an IR spectrum, we should see three different peaks, or really two different peaks, because three and four are going to show up at the same exact place, since they're pretty much the same modes, just in different dimensions. So, yes indeed, CO2 is IR active, and these are the modes of why it's active. Now let's ask, is CO2 Raman active? And this question is a little bit trickier. So the polarizability of the molecule needs to change. <laughs> so we're asking, the selection rule for Raman activity is, is there a change in polarizability? Or which modes have a change in polarizability and a general rule for polarizability is <laughs> bigger molecules are more polarizable than smaller molecules um, well maybe I should have said atoms there I always think of the halogens so if you take fluorine you know fluorine's a small molecule and its electrons are really close to it it's hard to pull the electrons off fluorine, so fluorine is not very polarizable. Whereas if you go down to iodine, so the halogen columns fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Iodine is a very big molecule, and the electrons aren't very close to the nucleus. So it's easy to pull the electrons away from the nucleus in iodine. So therefore iodine is like much more polarizable than fluorine. So, it's kind of an analogy with CO2 here. Is the first mode, is this mode, is the polarizability going to change? Yes, it is. Because it's like the molecules getting bigger and smaller. So yes, mode 1 is IR active. <laughs> what about the rest of the modes? Well, it's a little harder, and I'm kind of cheating because I already know. But the rest of the modes do not have a change in polarizability. Or at least a large change in polarizability. And so notice something here. Notice that all the modes that are IR active are Raman inactive, and all the modes that are Raman active are IR inactive. So, there's a general rule here. And that rule states that with molecules with inversion symmetry, any mode that is IR active is not going to be Raman active, and any mode that's Raman active is not going to be IR active. So that's what I just said there. So if you take another molecule like benzene, now there's a lot of vibrational modes for benzene. Um, well, you can probably tell immediately benzene has inversion symmetry. So if you find out all the IR active modes for benzene, then you already know the Raman active modes because benzene has a center of inversion or inversion symmetry. And the reason for that is a group theoretical argument, and I'm not going to go through the group theory here, maybe in a future video. But I hope you found that example insightful, and I hope you learned something. So thanks for watching, and have a great day.